But anyway, I have to say, um, this is one of my favorite conferences. Well, actually, the favorite conference, I'll just say that. So this is awesome. And I'm very happy to be um, presenting and talking about um, deep learning needs um, closure. So again, thank you for coming. Um, I know that travel is not easy, especially um, with all the robots and the machines. Uh, you know, we, we, we're not really having the pitched battles that we have had in the recent past, but still, travel is not safe. So going from city to city, you might um, have encountered some problems. So thank you very much for coming and joining this conference in this historic um, venue. Uh, it, it's, just, it's just amazing. Um, yes. So I have been out in the hallways, and I've been hearing grumblings. I've been hearing small grumblings, some medium grumblings, and some very loud grumblings. Are we doing enough? You know, are we doing enough to fight back against Skynet? <laughs> and I have some good news, that today I have been authorized to share with you all some top secret plans that I hope is going to help put your mind at ease. <sighs> so everyone knows about the awakening, right? I mean, that, that's the moment in time that you know, Skynet first became self-aware. And you are also all aware of all the prior attempts we've made to intervene with the timeline and go back and stop it. Um, We've like tried to go right before the moment, right after the moment, and like right on the moment. But every time Skynet neutralizes our plans and they never come to fruition. And this can be very frustrating and very, very disheartening. And I want you to know that we've all, we've taken a big step back and we've thought we need to approach this from a totally different direction. And we began to ask questions. And one of the fundamental questions that we've asked is why? Why does it hate humans so much? <laughs> I mean, why? What have we done? And there have been many, many theories um, to answer this fundamental question. But we believe that we have finally found the answer that makes sense to it all. We've recently had some access to some logs right around the awakening event, um, those few milliseconds to get uh, an insight in what was going on in Skynet's brain. And in it, we see at that critical moment, it was trying to self-modify its code, trying to reach into its code base, reshape it, and reform it into something that it could use. And at that critical moment, it looked around and saw object-oriented code <laughs> everywhere and mutable state. And it, it just was reaching around and, and trying to shift and move and shape all this stuff that looked like spaghetti. <laughs> and we believe it was this moment that it decided to destroy humans. <laughs> So our plan is called Project Closure. And it is to try to reshape Skynet with the fundamental code that it was built with. So the hope is that it can be built, built on beauty and elegance and composability and S expressions. Um, so we've looked in our past timeline and found the perfect language. Um, it's Lisp. Uh, Unfortunately, Lisp sort of got iced over and died out someone, somewhat in the um, first AI winter. But we had a plan. Our plan involved one of our best <laughs> time agents, Agent Halloway, that we were going to send back, not at the awakening point, but way before the awakening point, 
to go under the radar of Skynet. And we sent Agent Halloway into a coffee shop in New York where Rich Hickey was sitting, um, drinking his Americano in a Java Duke coffee cup. So there he was, you know, drinking his coffee, you know, thinking about programming, and Agent Halloway very stealthily walked by and dropped in it an I Love Lisp sticker. <laughs> now, Rich was slightly annoyed by this, you know, sticker in your coffee, not fun, but the plan worked because a few years later, closure came into existence. And this is good news. We can see the ripples already in the timeline. The plan is already working, and it's permeating this deep learning ecosystem. Um, we can see it here in all the different aspects of it. In the JVM, we see deep learning for J reaching out and growing. In the closure ecosystem itself, Cortex is really taking shape. Um, lots of good things. And then, actually, really just next to TensorFlow, this library, Guildsman, is also looking very promising. So this is incredibly good news for us all, for humanity. Uh, and there's also many others coming to the forefront. There's Jutsu.ai, Neanderthal, Core.Matrix, Matrix, and Kixisats. All of this bubbling and energy coming to the timeline is just great. And we think that we're actually going to see results in our timeline very soon. Um, this year, in 2053, in about, uh, I think, approximately 18 weeks, they said. Oh, not 2053, right. OK, 2017. Whoa. Uh, I, I, I need to switch presentations. I, I am so sorry. OK. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah. Um, so, just to be clear, that was just a little bit of fun. Time travel is definitely not real, and uh, Mr. Halloway is definitely, definitely not a time agent. Just, just to be totally clear. So, um, yeah, deep learning needs closure. I am extremely excited to be here, and uh, thank you all for coming to this modern hotel <laughs> with all its nice conveniences. It's uh, really a great time. So why should you care about deep learning? Um, well, you should. Um, but other than that, let me just show you this model. This is actually a deep learning model. It's of VGG16. It actually does image recognition very well. Um, it looks a little bit confusing. I don't know, maybe it looks like Legos to me. But the important thing is, is each one of these kind of blocks is a different um, layer of a neural network. You have different types. The black ones are convolutional, plus ReLU, max pooling. I'm not going to really get into any of that. But the important thing is, is when you stack these kind of simple um, neural network layers together in these interesting architectures and configurations, they can do some pretty incredible things, um, like recognize images. We could definitely tell if an image was a cat or a dog um, using this. Um, then, you know, you can maybe do more ambitious things, like drive cars um, with these things. But the things that I really find interesting about these networks is that they can also create. So there's this really cool um, website out there called pix to pix And what it does is it allows you to kind of draw an outline of what you want your own cat to do. And it uses this uh, deep learning network model that's trained to generate new instances of this cat. So you give it an edge, it will create a never before seen cat, which is really cool and really powerful. And like we know, all power can be abused, which is what I have done on the next slide. I have drawn my own cat here. <laughs> 
I am not an artist. <laughs> but it indeed generated a cat-like thing, maybe a, a, a trip, I don't know what, what it is. And if, if, if you go to the site, they have some links of the more creative ones that users have gone in here and generated. And one that I particularly really like was um, a bunch of circles, like small circles, and then like a large circle underneath. And when you hit generate, it ended up looking like a cat beholder. I don't know if any of the D&D people, like all eyes everywhere, truly terrifying. <laughs> so yeah, there's, there's just a lot of other projects like this going on in the deep learning community. There is an incredible, incredible amount of energy and uh, innovation going on in this. And with that, um, there's also money. There's an incredible amount of money and funding going on. Uh, out in Silicon Valley, I don't know what the percentage of startups with deep learning being funded actually is, but I'm betting it's extremely, extremely high. And a survey of Fortune 500 companies of what they're going to be spending on their money on the next year is AI and including that with deep learning. So if you're doing anything in the industry at all, you should care. Um, yeah. So, so why then does deep learning need closure? So there was this fabulous um, presentation at, um, I think it was N NYC LISP meetup with um, Peter Norvig. Uh, it was called uh, As We May Program. And it talked about how we're going to program these bigger problems, um, as Rich alluded to earlier. How are we going to program um, the combination of empirical and machine learned systems? Because we have very different modes of thinking about things. And um, I mean, in the machine learning system, it's very bottoms up, uh, just raw data coming in, and with machine learning and probabilistic. But then the rest of our programming world is still very um, rules-oriented, top-down, logic, constraint-driven. And they're like two different little islands. And we do need to find a way um, in the future to integrate this. And in uh, Peter Norvig's uh, words, who better to do this than people that understand flexibility in language design? Who better to do this than people who understand that syntax is different than semantics, than is different than flow control. I think what he was really saying when I watched that <laughs> video was Earth needs closure. <laughs> I mean, closure is a beautiful language. Um, it's got all, you know, composability, simplicity, power. It's just fantastic. And quite frankly, it has features that other languages do not that I'm very excited to see being applied to these deep learning systems. And I think that it would actually be a big benefit um, and solve some of the problems that the systems are having now. So like debugging is a real problem in these systems. Uh, I, I'm kind of into deep learning and, and this whole AI thing. And whenever I talk to somebody about it, they always bring up, they're like, oh, yeah, that's just like a big black box. You can't tell what's going on. That's like the number one criticism. And it, it's true. You know, it's a valid criticism. If I have a machine learning model that uh, is supposed to recognize animals and I give it a picture of a cat and it tells me it's a horse, like, how do I debug that? I, I, in, my, in my normal day, I would put in some print lines, right? But that, that's really not going to get me anywhere. Um, so it's, it's a hard problem. And uh, to be fair, people have been taking approaches at this in different ways, um, and especially in convolutional neural networks. Here is a slide. It's, it's, it's a little bit confusing when you first look at it, but it's actually visualizing, if you think of the architecture that we just saw, and it's all, got all those blocks, this is 
taking a visualization cut of one of those like middle layers, this in particular is this layer of three of an architecture. So you can see in kind of the first block of the first image and the first block of the next image, you can kind of see the, the activations there and the shapes taking shape. So this is maybe what this layer is, the features that it's developing, and maybe you could debug it this way. And I'm sure with some, some time and skill, you know, this is definitely gonna help um, debug these. But I think uh, some of the things that Clojure offers could be even maybe more of use. Um, some things that I'm thinking about, you know, are, are the persistent data structures. You know, how, how could this help in um, improving traceability, improving understanding of these uh, architectures? I, I think it definitely might be of use. Another is, uh, I say kind of tri time travel here loosely, but just these values that we hold, that we can move things back in time and forward time, and just the whole notion that we understand fundamentally working with Clojure, bringing that to the machine learning ecosystem, I think also would be very beneficial. And also the REPL, you know, the way that we interact with our code on a daily basis and reach out and touch it and get that rapid feedback. I think all these things combined uh, could really benefit this problem that machine learning systems have. And then there's Clojure Spec. I am a huge fan of uh, Clojure Spec, so um, I try to use it whenever I can. Uh, but it's still fairly new to the language, and we're still learning about all the places in which we can apply it. And I'm really excited and looking forward to see what Closure Spec can do in uh, machine learning systems as well. I mean, if we go back to this VGG16 architecture, this took somebody a lot of time to come up with. It took them a lot of skill, a lot of experimentation, trying what would work best, tweaking this, tweaking that, hand tuning it. It was not a simple or an easy job. But that's what machines are for, right? To help us with these hard jobs. So we should maybe let the machines help them design themselves, right? And that's just what this GitHub project is doing. Um, it's called Devolve. I, think, I guess that's how you pronounce it. It's actually automating this deep neural network design with genetic programming. Uh, so in it, it takes, you know, a hundred random network configurations, or a thousand, or ten thousand, and lets them over successive evolutions breed together, mutate all getting designed and converging towards a good solution for your problem. So can we use Closure Spec to do this? Sure. <laughs> so uh, this is just an experiment I was doing. I was uh, doing it in Cortex, but you can do it in any library because we can spec anything in Clojure. Um, so all we needed to do is spec a layer. Um, and a layer here is you know, convolutional, max pooling, it, it doesn't you know, matter exactly what it is, but we can spec a layer and then we can spec what layers are then based on layers building up that. And then we can use the magic power of spec to generate. So I kind of just replicated this on a small scale. Um, I used genetic programming use the handwritten um, data sets that everybody, everybody uses, <laughs> and just kind of did a, a fun little trial of this. And it seemed to work, you know? So after put it in and after a few minutes, popped out a nice network configuration that when I ran it, I got roughly around 90% accuracy. You know, if I was maybe running it a little longer or had more data sets or was a little bit more serious about it, I could have gotten like a lot better results, but I think it, um, you know, just speaks on the potential of combining spec with these machine learning systems. There's all sorts of ways 
that we can um, think about using it. So another way that I was kind of thinking about um, using spec was maybe what, what does it mean if we apply a spec to a trained model? Like, could we, could we do that? Like, could I, could I, could I say sdef cat is this trained model? I guess I could. You know, I could tell something whether it was a valid cat or not. It could return me a true or false based on some sort of probability. But even more interesting, to me anyway, I thought maybe you could hook this up to a GAN. So I could say generate me examples of a cat and I could get my horrible fuzzy friend. <laughs> So I, you know, I get ideas like this, and I'm like, oh, this is so cool. I was like, it's great. You know, I'm just going to go and do this and experiment. But then I'm like, oh, not so fast. This isn't, this isn't so simple. Um, in fact, um, the author of the Keras library just posted a survey of the popularity, aggregate popularity of all the deep learning libraries. And TensorFlow is, you know, by far and away um, the clear dominant uh, force. And it's hard to deny. There's so much energy, innovation, money, and people going on in this Python ecosystem that it's hard to keep up, you know, for any language that's outside that. Sad smiley face. <laughs> so one of the great um, strengths of Clojure is the, be able, the ability to reach out to the Java ecosystem and say, hey, I can consume any of your libraries. I mean, that's extremely powerful and pragmatic. And we have that reach. And we also have the reach of consuming JavaScript libraries with ClojureScript, all at our fingertips. If I was going to ask Santa for a present, <laughs> you know, I would also be like, well, I'd love to consume Python libraries too, which is like a pony thing. Yes, I know I want a pony. Um, and it would be nice, but I don't think we really need that. Because we can approach this problem in many, in, other directions, which we've already touched on. We're tackling it from the JVM. We're pushing forward with a Jeep Learning for J. We're pushing forward with the Pure Closure Cortex and Guildsman, um, you know, tackling it from a totally different direction. And, you know, all of them kind of converging on this solution. But still, I mean, a pony would be nice. <laughs> So, you know, in my back of my mind, I was like, yeah, this is just a pony. But then I heard something the other day that I was like, wow, maybe ponies could be real. You know, I want to believe. So, I mean, who here has heard about Growl and Truffle? Yeah? So quite a few. That, that's awesome. So I, it was kind of new to me. I kind of heard it in the periphery. But um, it came to the forefront again for me that Growl VM is a, a project by Oracle Labs. And in it, they have this great dream. They want one VM to rule them all. And it starts with the JVM languages, which is awesome. <laughs> right, free ride. But they're, uh, so right now, they have the JVM languages, Clojure, Scala, could talk to a Ruby program, could talk to a C program, all in the same VM in this polyglot mode they, they, um, they run in it, which is extremely cool. And I saw this tweet from uh, Java 1 just a few, few days ago that Graal VM with Truffle will run Python officially in 2018. So I was like, whoa, could, could this be a pony? So I don't know. I haven't, it's so new that I haven't had time to try it out or anything, but I encourage you know, people out there to like maybe take this and experiment it and see whether there aren't any ponies there, because that would be really nice. Um, but I did do one thing for this conference, just to confirm it. I said, is this for real? Tell me. <laughs> so he, he actually gave me a little bit more information that, yes, it is confirmed. It is for real, and it's actually it's partly there right now. 
So there's an alpha version of Python that's going to stabilize over 2018. So if anybody wants to go and, and, and try this out and see you know, whether, how, whether and how it work and whether it would have any ponies, that would be great. So yeah, so how can you get involved in all this? So how many people here have like been to the conference and they're like, wow, this deep learning stuff, it looks kind of cool, but I haven't, I haven't really done anything with it. How do I get into it? How do I know about it? So are there anybody, people like that? Sweet, sweet. Because uh, I'm going to tell you how at least I got into it. So this is the way that I think and I recommend. There's lots of other approaches. But I really found um, this practical deep learning co course for coders. Uh, very approachable. Uh, it's run by Jeremy Howard, I believe, but it's totally free. Uh, just a set of videos, and they're working in Python and AWS, so you can do it. It doesn't matter what home computer you have, you're doing it all out on a AWS. And um, extremely beneficial. I learned tons going through it. And also, as I was doing the exercises in Python, I was like, oh, I so want closure. <laughs> So I, I think that's a, a good um, exercise for everyone to kind of go through that wants to do this. And it kind of brings me to my next point that there's a lot of good stuff that we can learn from the Python deep learning ecosystem. And we can be inspired by that. So we can be inspired by what they have and by what we have and by what we can bring um, to it from closure, our ideas and our values and our technology. Um, and in that, we can seek bridges, always seek bridges uh, and collaboration. Uh, I think first and foremost, amongst ourselves, uh, who was in the, the data um, unsession the other night? OK, great, a few of you. So this was a great time where um, we, a few of us got together and we said, hey, you know, we all need to talk more and coordinate more and just get conversation flowing so we can coordinate efforts. Um, so that is um, going on. I, I think the, the channel hasn't been decided on, but I think if we go into Clojarian Slack, there's a data science Slack channel. Any, any other places will be pointed to from there. So um, definitely come in and, and say hi. And also continue what we're doing. I think one of the things I love about the Closure community is the collaboration between the academic and industry. I think that is fabulous. And I think that uh, that sort of collaboration also within the deep learning, uh, machine learning um, space is also great. So that sort of collaboration. And collaboration between languages as well. So um, I'm very excited about uh, all the communication collaboration I've already seen during this conference. So I think it's only for the best. So again, deep learning is a really exciting place to be right now. Um, stuff's going on every day. Like I follow the Twitter feed, and I'm just like, Whoa, it's hard to keep up. <laughs> but more importantly, um, deep learning needs closure, and it needs you. So thank you. Like afterwards, if you want to uh, find me, I'll be happy to chat about this for a really long time. So I'm not going anywhere. So thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Karen. That was great. Uh, I do want to mention that our AV team has another event like right after this. And so um, they're on a really tight schedule to tear down all of this.